Hi, my name is Andrea Zaki, and I'm from Digital Silver Imaging. I'm Scott Niedemeyer, and I am also with Digital Silver Imaging. And today we're going to present a webinar on digitizing your film archive. We presented this webinar about a week ago for uh, the Colorado Photographic Arts Center, and it went so well that we decided to make a little bit more of a streamlined version so uh, you could watch it in uh, hopefully about 25 minutes as opposed to the two hours with all the question and answers we had. So uh, why don't you take it away, Scott? So you guys should be seeing my screen. It's gonna be very similar to the last presentation for anybody that watched that. And you know, we, we gave this really great presentation on the importance of archiving uh, your collection, of taking that linear film and getting it to digital. Um, and it was about the value of that. And so we're gonna to touch on that a little bit, but more of what we wanna to cover today is the differences between those systems that are available to you to purchase from your local camera store um, versus our system and what we're doing that makes us very, very special at Digital Silver Imaging. So let's start with the first one here, digitize your film archive. This is just a breakdown of what we're gonna cover. Uh, capture scanning methods and choices, similar to the last one. Best practices, file format choices, and that's something I really wanna hit on, storage and archive considerations, as well as the cost. And that's a really big one. You know, What is the cost difference between all of these kind of formats and systems? Click on the screen, go to the next one. You guys still seeing that? You still seeing that, Andrea? Yeah, looks good. Okay, awesome. Three questions to ask yourself. And this is something that like is kind of a, as you're thinking about your film archive and, and the, you know, the box of film that you have sitting on the shelf and it's hanging out there and you're like, okay, what am I going to do you know, with that? Um, the three questions that I want you to continually ask yourself as you're looking at it is, why am I not digitizing my film and prints? Why am I not taking that material that's essentially not doing anything for me sitting on a shelf and doing something with it to make it a productive material, uh, to make it have value, and we'll go over that. So first question, why am I not digitizing my film and my prints? Number two, what are my best choices from converting analog to digital? Like what's gonna be best for me and for my end goal, for my outcome? Uh, so I'm gonna hit on some of those choices. And again, everybody's gonna have a different answer to that question. I want you asking yourselves that question. And then number three, how will my archive be used? Where is it going to live? Who's my audience? Um, is it something that's for sale? Is it something that is simply for my family to share, you know, amongst ourselves because it's important, you know, family history, it's important family archives. So those are the three questions I really want you to hit on. The importance of digitizing your R5, number one, monetary value. When we think about does my film have value? Absolutely, your film has value. Uh, this is uh, myself working with Elliot Irwitt in New York City on his film archive. And Elliot is an incredibly successful commercial photographer. He's one of the original Magnum photographers uh, in the world uh, in New York City. Um, just, you know, for those of us in the photo realm, an incredibly talented and inspirational man to, to look at his work and learn from. And, you know, he is a business person. He creates images to sell. And so we worked on this project with Elliot of taking all of his old film archive or the key selects from his film archive and putting it in a digital format so that it can continue to be used, that can be made into books so that, you know, it can continue to be made into prints. Um, you know, Elliot's not hanging out in his dark room anymore. Um, he does still have a printer, but, you know, now what? As his family moves forward with his legacy and his heritage, now what do they do to continue to have value to those prints? Um, I know that... I know that uh... In our previous webinar, we had somebody write in the chat, well, I'm not Elliot Irwitt, but I just wanted to mention too here, Scott, is that we've had customers like, uh, we have a customer, Barry Schneier, um, who photographed Bruce Springsteen at kind of his breakout concert. There was a really high powered rock and roll journalist at that concert, and he wrote of that concert, um, I've seen the future of rock and roll, and it is Bruce Springsteen. But um, Basically, this photographer, Barry, has kind of made a second career out of just those images. But again, you don't have to be uh, famous or photograph a celebrity. I mean, if you're an equine photographer or if you have great photographs of uh, uh, landscapes or maybe uh, historical photographs, uh, all those have a lot of value. I mean, it's it's. You know, just because your work is something that you created years ago when you still shot film, or maybe you are a photographer who still shoots film, um, you know, it, it has to have value in some way. Um, and think about, you know, the other thing to, to mention is NFT art and how NFT art is exploding on the scene right now. I just had a friend of mine sell his second piece via NFT art. And um, 
I mean, that's amazing. That's really cool. And all of a sudden there's a new format out there, a new platform for, you know, creators and photographers to be able to, to sell material. And so that realistically, NFT is a what? Uh, non, non-fangible token. Fungible. Fungible? Fungible. Fangible? Fungible. Fungible. Token. It's yeah, it's all that. Uh, Bitcoin. It's blockchain world. Blockchain. I've been I've been doing research on it and trying to teach myself. It's blockchain. it's a bit confusing. I'm old school. I still another webinar. Linear. That's a whole other webinar. <laughs> yeah, blockchain and what do you do? <laughs> um, but you know the the point is is that you know if your work is just sitting in a box on the shelf, um, that's it. It it has no value. The moment that you you take that work off the shelf that's and right. you go, you know what? Let's do something with this. It has value, which brings me to my next side: the utility of it, the utility of taking that film and getting it into a format that can be used for, you know, for reinvigorating your career, you know, like our friend Barry um, selling those images of the Bruce Springsteen concert that he took years ago, you know, hanging out, didn't think anything of it. And all of a sudden his kids were like, yo, dad, this is, this is amazing. This is important stuff. The world needs right. to see this. And now all of a sudden he has a whole nother career going off of just that work. Um, I mean, who knows how many of us out there have, have the next great thing sitting on our shelves? Like, I don't know, right? Could be you, could be me. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, and I also good. think that utility, Scott, kind of points to the fact that uh, anymore, if you have negatives, the chances of somebody taking those negatives and bringing them into a dark room and printing them are pretty slim. So mm -hmm. if the work isn't digitized, then the chances of it just getting lost or not ever getting uh, used again are, are minimal. Are you going to lose, you know, that, that goes the whole thing. Are you going to leave it for your family to take care of? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure people in my family would be like, oh, dad's old crap, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. And then what? Um, it. Yeah, get it, get it moved on. Um, you know, the important thing is to take that and turn it into something to, to, to give it life. Right. And right. that's the whole point to utility. And not everything is about this massive, you know, is not an Elliot Erwitt or a Barry Schneier. It's it, you know, sometimes it's about the legacy. And uh, on the last webinar, the last webinar I touched on this, th what you're seeing here is these are journals. My grandmother was a school teacher in, in Montana. She was born in a cabin and my great grandmother, um, even older than that, was born in a cabin in the, in the mountains at the turn of the century. And she was a school teacher and she just journaled incessantly. She had journals of her whole life. And uh, she passed several years ago. And I learned about these journals. Um, my mom mentioned it to me. My uncle in California had them. And so I contacted my uncle and I, and I was just like, yo, Uncle Milk, I would love to take those journals and digitize them. I would love to take this family history and, and legacy and put it in a format so it can be shared with all of us. It's not just the keeper of the journals, but something I, I archived them on uh, the same system that, that we use for our film and created PDFs and then emailed them to everybody in the family so that everybody could have a chance to read grandma's journals. The image that you're looking at is actually my grandfather and my mom has been, you know, the one in our family working diligently to take all of this old family film and these, you know, just boxes and boxes of prints and negatives and photo albums and get them into a digital format for just that purpose that it can be shared. So, you know, that's the kind of the third thing is you have the mon monetary value and then you have the legacy. You know, you have the, the, the ability to take your family's history or something that's important to you and putting it in a shareable format. And so that goes into the kind of the breakdown of, you know, the reasons why you would want to digitize your archive. I also think, too, Scott, that you showed a journal there. And, you know, one of the one of the real beauties of our system is um, you could it it digitizes both negatives, uh, positive transparencies, prints and uh, flat artwork very easily and at very high resolutions. And uh, so they meet FAGI uh, standards, which are the Library of Congress standards. Correct. Yeah, the, the system that we use is the same that's used by the Smithsonian, the Tate, the Getty uh, Library of Congress. Um, and it can do everything. I mean, we can do transmissive material, which is slides, chromes, negs, uh, all the way up to, and flat art, all the way up to 20 by 24. So it has that flexibility. It's not like, uh, it's not like our, you know, our low res options here, um, you know, and the low res options are, are great. You can buy these things on Amazon. The one in the upper left hand corner there is a, is a Kodak box that, um, you know, somebody's pinging me. I'm just going to pause that um, is a Kodak thing that you can you can buy on Amazon for, I don't know, $35. And it's literally your phone goes into it and there's a little light box to put the slide underneath. Right. Um, and it's a really low res solution. It's a low res answer, but at least it's an answer. Uh, you know, with this, the flatbed scanners, you have limitations according to side. Most of the flatbed scanners are going to be an 8x12 or a 9x12 format. So you're limited by that size. And then, of course, the different capabilities of the scanners. Um, yeah. 
Uh, can I mention something about the low res scanner, Scott? Yeah. Uh, the flatbed scanner, excuse me. Is it also, you know, when you look at the resolution of a flatbed scanner, that's for the entire surface of the flatbed scanner. So if you put a 35 millimeter nag or, or 35 millimeter slide on there, you're chopping that uh, resolution up into pieces, right? Your little pieces. Correct. Yeah, yeah. When they when they talk about the when they speak about the resolution of their system, it's for the whole deck, not for that individual little um, dots per inch. If we get into the technical, now if all you're doing is taking your family history and your family archive, um, and and you're putting it in a format that can be shared, that's amazing. Please do that. You know, I mean, that's the whole thing that I'm here to do is encourage you to digitize your archive. Um, but again, these are very low res. They're not going to have a lot of um, possibility, um, but they are the cheapest solution. So if you just have a bunch of film, I want to get it digitized. This is going to be the by far the most economical solution for you with a little bit of effort. In the corner there, I have a box service. And the box service is where you just take all of your prints and film and you stick it in a box and you mail it to this lab. And you know, some person sitting in a building somewhere pulls out the box and you know, scans your film and it's really cheap, it's low res. Uh, it takes a couple of weeks to a couple of months, depending on how busy they are. Uh, there were several that used to offshore everything to China. There's a few of them that have now committed to uh, continuing to do that here in the US. I think there's one in Chicago and one in St. Louis. Um, you know, there, there may be Boston, one in Boston. Too. Yeah. Um, and that is an option, but just keep in mind, you're not gonna have a qualified tech on the other side and it is just gonna be low res. You know, and there's not a lot of assurances on how your your film and digital is handled. And I'm sure they do a very good job, which is why they're still in business. But you just you don't have that personal connection with the person on the other side. So that's something to keep in mind. The next up is the higher res or legacy scanners. Now, in the corner, I have an Epson V850, which is kind of the, the current model of Epson's uh, achievable scanner. It's it's thirteen hundred to fifteen hundred dollars to purchase that scanner. Um, you know, from, from a photo store and it's a pretty good option. You know, it's a nine by 12 deck. You can do transmissive, you can wet mount to it. Uh, it's a very flexible system. The, the, you know, the software that Epson uses is pretty good. Um, but again, it kind of caps out at that optical resolution of like 600 or something like that. I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, so there's only so much you can get out of it. Um, the, the other one that we have here is the Imicon and, and the Hasselblad, the Imicon slash Hasselblad scanners. And these were really, really good. I myself owned one of these. We used to use them in the lab uh, there in Belmont, Mass. That, that's what we use. We use the Imicon because it was a great scanner. It was a you know, $20,000, $25,000 scanner that, that was a virtual drum scanner. Uh, you didn't wet mount the film. It did curve the film. The film would go into a holder that would bend it over a light source so that it was reading line by line and it gave very, very good results. But again, all of these are kind of old technology, they're dated. And one of the things with old technology is as our operating systems and our computers get better and better and better and they get upgraded, any of this legacy hardware is not getting upgraded. Uh, the problem that you run into now with the Imicon, the Hasselblad scanners is the computer to run it. Um, you know, For mine, I had to have a dedicated sawtooth tower just to run that system that's the, it was running os9 and its only purpose was to run that scanner and that's really frustrating because now i'm moving forward with technology and scanning on one computer getting it into some sort of format to then get it on another computer to compare it to another format you're just taking a lot of steps that's very frustrating yeah. it's yeah. time the reason, that's the reason we moved into the instant image capture systems is because we did have the uh the imicon hasselblad uh, x5 scanners but um we had breakdowns and they don't make parts for them anymore and uh, the software is not supported anymore so we looked we're looking for a solution that would carry us in you know to the future and not be something that we were constantly scrambling to find parts for mm -hmm. it's uh, the, you know the it was a wonderful system uh for what it was uh but they stopped producing anything for it back in 2019 so that means whatever's on the shelf is on the shelf um, once it's gone, it's gone. I have a friend of mine who uh, teaches at SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design in uh, Savannah, Georgia. And they have a bunch of these, you know, Imicon scanners, these Hasselblad scanners. And I asked him, I'm like, you know, what happens when they die? And he was like, I got a box of parts. He goes, as soon as they announced that they were discontinuing them, I ordered a bunch of parts so that I knew I could have a little more life out of these before the school had to go into a transitionary period. And, uh, and that's just something to keep in mind for you guys out there who are you know, potentially using the system or working you know, with another facility that uses that system. The, uh, the, the one in the lower left corner uh, is a film toaster. 
um, which is a 35 millimeter that you put on a box with a light box source. And it's pretty, it's pretty cool for what it is. It's limited to up to four by five. So it's limited in its size. And then, you know, you're limited according to the capabilities of the camera that you put on top. And then you've got the lens to consider because even if you have a really great Sony camera, but you're using them like a cheaper Rokinon lens because it's the macro that you could afford, you know, there's where your breakdown in quality is going to come. You know, you're, you're using a macro lens that's not intended for flat art. Yeah, you're getting a 67 megapixel file out of that Sony, but it's only 14 bit color. So with every system that's out there, you have to consider the limitations in what it can offer you. And for some, you know, for some people that's going to be perfect. That's going to be exactly what they need. And I support that as long as you're taking the steps to archive your film, that's amazing. But if you really want to do something with that film, make a big print. Uh, put it into a system that can be sold that meets Library of Congress standards, then you're going to want to look to other solutions. Those other solutions uh, move up the food chain into the professional market, and there's the drum scanners. Now, we're all familiar with drum scanners. They've been around for a long time, and, and you know, they're the this big acetate tube that the film gets mounted to. Uh, it's a wet mount. It used to be oil. Um, now we just, I learned about a new product today called Cami, Cami Fluid, something like that from Aztec. Uh, which is a flammable fluid. It's not an oil mount, but it's a flammable fluid. So it evaporates very quickly. Um, so you wet mount it to that drum and the drum spins at a really fast rate. And then the, the, the laser scanner, you know, the, the, the reader goes over and reads line by line very, very carefully as that thing is sitting there spinning. And it takes a tremendous amount of time for a really high res drum scan. You're looking at an hour plus for one scan. Um, and the things that I want to point out is that if you have a good technician, if you have a good person running that drum scanner, they know what they're doing. You trust them. They're very careful. They double check themselves. They treat your film with respect. You can get a really good drum scan. You know, you can get a wonderful scan out of a drum scan. The disadvantages are that it's expensive and it's time consuming. If you send a batch of film off to somebody to have drum scanned, you're looking at a couple of weeks to a month. They're not going to be able to just crank it out in one or two days uh, because it has to be wet mounted, scanned quality checked, then unmounted, cleaned, the whole tube needs to be cleaned, then the next piece of film gets loaded on. Or what they'll do is they'll batch load film. So they'll do five or, or 10 in a row. You know what I mean? So if you've got enough to fill that tube, they're going to fill that tube up. Um, and it's just very, very time consuming. So drum scanners um, are the professional known item for scanning and for archiving on the market, but they don't meet FAGI standards because of the wet mount, because of the potential risk of damage to the product that's being scanned. That's why you won't find a drum scanner in, in any sort of library of arts and science place. None of the big universities are going to be running them. Uh, you know, none of the big museums are going to be running them. And, you know, some people are like, oh, well, you know, that's amazing for, you know, film that was shot by Irving Penn and, or, you know, throwing somebody out there who's famous and everybody should know right away, you know, something that was, that was, you know, photographed or this material that was created by this really famous person. I'm not a famous person, but that doesn't matter. Your film still has value whether it has value to you, whether it's like the whole Bruce Springsteen images that, you know, the guy didn't even think, you know, that they had value until somebody said, Hey, you know what, this is really important. Like let's, I bet, I bet people would want to buy that. And now he's selling prints like crazy over something that he created, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, so you never know your film does have value. So moving on to our system, the instant image capture system, this is a phase one system. We use a phase one 150 megapixel back at the heart of it. And if you're looking at it, I know what you're saying. Yes, it is a gigantic copy stand. It is a gigantic copy stand, but it's a gigantic copy stand that meets very exacting standards. And that's the difference between our system and maybe some of the other copy stands that are on the market. Because you can go buy a copy stand from, from B&H or Robert's Camera, um, Photo Care. You know, there are, there, are, there are shops out there that sell copy stands and materials for you to be able to create your own archive. The biggest difference between those and ours is that our light sources meet a 98 CRI. And for anybody who wants to geek out with me, go look that up. Um, it's a color table index to, to make sure that it's within very exacting standards. And most, you know, like I've got a Porter Trace light box over here that I use and I've had for forever. That's a, that's a CFL tube on the inside. It doesn't have any CR, maybe it has a CRA <laughs> rating. I don't know what it is. It's not going to be color accurate. It's not going to give you the best results across a spectrum. That was my pun for the day across a spectrum of film, whether it's black and white or neg or chrome. So our light source is very, very accurate. And then of course, at the heart of it is a phase 150 megapixel digital back. Now, what's the difference between the drum scan that gives us a, you know, a six or 800 meg file and the phase one system that gives us a 800 meg file? Um, the drum scan takes an hour to get that file. It's wet mounted. 
Um, if it doesn't work or you make a mistake, everything has to be cleaned and then redone. And now you're looking at two hours, three hours. The tech behind the machine makes all the difference in the world and it's expensive. I mean, average drum scan in America is about $170, 150 to $170 for one scan at its maximum resolution. Yeah, depending uh, on resolution and it's all yeah. over the place. And at different, different places, depending on the drum scanners they're running, if they're running an old drum scanner, the prices are going to be cheaper. Uh, if they're running a new drum scanner, some of them tend to be more expensive. I've seen prices range on the drum scans anywhere from $125 a scan to $210 a scan, uh, depending on the lab. Um, so it's really kind of all over the place. Uh, the difference between ours is it's a dry mount. There's nothing invasive happening to it. And it's the maximum resolution every time. At the click of a button, at the release of the shutter, we're taking a capture at a full 16-bit. It's an IIQ file, but we're going to get a full 16-bit TIFF. We're going to get a full 8, 900 meg file out of that. And if something's not right, if there's a piece of dust on it, or you know, the, the, we didn't get the exposure right, you know, something's not wrong, we grab our bubble duster, spray off the film, adjust the exposure, hit the button, we've got our next capture. So it's instant, it's right away. So any, you know, as far as quality controls, um, it's a lot easier for us to look at your film and go, oh, you know, this exposure needs to be brighter, this exposure needs to be darker, make that adjustment, get the capture, throw the other one away and hand you the best file possible. So and that's a huge advantage. Yeah, so um, Scott, wouldn't it also be true that if uh, we also have a white glove service where if you have a, a large number of captures, we can come right to you and you could literally, or someone in your lab or yourself could be sitting there and reviewing captures as you make them, right? That was that was what we did with Elliot's archive when when we were doing Elliot Ertz archive. Um, I networked the the computers together, so I networked my computer to Mio Nakamura, who is uh, Elliot's studio manager and right hand man. Uh, just incredibly organized, wonderful human being. Uh, shout out to Mio. But I uh, I networked the computers together, so as I was dropping to my computer. Um, Mio would pull the files onto his computer and start QCing and reviewing them right there. So if there were any mistakes made in file naming or, you know, I mean, you're looking at a, you're looking at thousands. I mean, I, I did thousands of images and your eyes tend to get a little bit blurry as you're doing it. And instead of scanning number 35A, I scan number 36, right? You guys all know on the, on the film, sometimes it's a little, is it this one or is it this one? Let's go with that one. No, never mind. It was this one. Mio could catch me on that right away. And we just went back and fixed it, you know, and, and the problem was solved right away. And that's the advantage, that instant capture system and that white glove service. I'm going to hit on the van later. Just wait, I'm, I'm going to tell you about the van. It's going to be amazing. Um, so there, there's just- I also want to say that focus is, you know, comparing this to some of the systems that mount to a DSLR, the way that we, the laser focusing and the depth of field that we get by using a flat, specially designed flat field lens are really huge advantages. Oh, gigantic. The biggest problem I think people make is that when they're using, if you're using a, a 35 SLR on your copy stand, is they're not making sure that the camera, right, your film plane is parallel to your digital film plane, right? So you've got your art here and you've got the film plane itself on the center of the camera. And if it's off a little bit in one direction or the other, um, that's going to throw the focus of the image off. It's going to make it soft as it goes down. It's not going to give you the best quality. Um, we use a laser aligner to make sure that everything from our film plane to our material plane is completely parallel. Uh, and, and the lenses that we use are designed specifically for flat work. And what that means is that they're sharp edge to edge. So the entire image circle is crisp. Uh, a lot of SLR lenses are not that way. If you really start to pixel peep and you get to the outside edges, uh, things will go soft. You know, so if you're zoomed all the way in on an image, like say you're photographing an eight by 10, you had an eight by 10 Chrome or an eight by 10 image that you're, you're creating a repro on a dupe, um, you know, when you fill that frame on a 35 or another system, you're actually going to get soft on your outside edges. And that's not going to give you the best quality possible. Um, our system is designed specifically according to Library of Congress standards um, and that FAGI4 and Metamorphos um, guidelines in order to be sharp edge to edge, which is really important. The other thing is, is, you know, I'm just going to touch on cost, you know, on the, we were talking about the drum scans, we were speaking about the drum scans and how they range in price, you know, from 125 to $210, depending on, on the, the, you know, the, the location that's scanning them and the tech that's running it and the resolution. Um, ours, if you look on our website, go to DSS website, um, it's a fixed price and it's always a maximum resolution scan. It can be down after the fact if you so choose, 
But when we deliver a file to you, we're delivering the maximum file every single time for one set price. Um, and that is a bit of a pitch. I mean, that's really what we're here. We're talk here to talk about our system and what makes our system different. And that's one of the things that makes a difference. It's instant. It's, it's you know, white glove, lint-free, special handling. You're not wet mounting your film. You're not risking any damage to the film. It's instant and it's really, really incredibly cost effective. Um, we feel that as technology has increased and we have all of this capability of technology, um, why not pass the savings to, you know, on to the, to you guys out there? You know, um, I think any of the labs that are continuing to try and charge drum scanning prices while using a copy stand system, that's just not fair to the customer. That's not fair to the people out there. Um, technology moves forward for a reason. Netflix is getting cheaper and cheaper every year. I mean, come on. <laughs> I've got my Amazon. I can watch my movie. It's not like it used to be where you had to pay for the really expensive cable service. No, now it's 15 bucks a month, right? And it's the same thing with our cameras and our technology. As it gets better, you know, we're more capable with our timeline, how fast and the quality that we can output. We might as well pass that savings on to, to you. Everybody wins. Um, just a couple of comparisons. Now, this is a four by five Imicon versus the phase one. And this was done on our Imicon in, in the lab in Belmont and done on the phase one in our lab in Belmont. And I just wanna caveat on this film. It is from a film called New 55, uh, which is a company out of Boston that's, uh, that's making or recreating a Polaroid type 55 film. Um, which is really kind of cool for any of those old, old filmophiles out there. I think I was telling Andrea, I have about five boxes of type 55 left stashed away. Um, it's stuff is gold, right? ka and, Yeah, right. I can, I can print money with that stuff. Um, Not the, if you keep holding on to it. You can. I know, I need, to, I need to either shoot it or offload it. If anybody wants some Type 55, call me. Um, with this negative in particular, the reason it looks so thin on the Imicon is because the, the negative itself is thin um, in the way that it comes out from, from that new 55. Uh, and the, the big thing to point out here and the difference is that you know, just the straight scan on the Imicon, we load it in 300, you know, DPI. I'm not going to make any adjustments. I'm going to let the machine do its work. It takes about five to seven minutes to make that scan. And this is the results that's straight out of the machine with no adjustments, um, as opposed to our instant image capture system with the phase one digital back. Um, literally, it gets loaded into the carrier and I go click at a 60th of a second and there's my image. And that's because the phase one has significantly more dynamic range. It has a larger DMAX point than a lot of flatbed um, drum scanners, virtual drum scanners. Now, yeah, I think this is an interesting example too, Scott. I'm just gonna jump in here is because yes. the new 55 makes really beautiful negatives. Um, so it's, this is no, you shouldn't look at this and say, well, the new 55 is not great. But what it is, is it looks very different than a traditional black and white film negative. So if you're the operator, uh, to probably make this scan probably took a good 15 minutes. Um, so that's 15 minutes lost because basically you'd have to rescan it uh, mm -hmm. by adjusting the curves for that specific film. Whereas with, you know, the, with the instant system, you load it into the carrier, make it in focus, hit the button, you see it on the screen right away. Uh, and if any adjustments need to be made, they can be right then, you know, right then and there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, time has value, right? The old adage, time is money, time has value. Um, yeah. And just the capability. I mean, if you take, uh, if you, I mean, the nice thing about the Hasselblad system is it did put out a proprietary raw file um, at its core. And we all, we all know that you always want to shoot in raw, whereas, you know, an Epson or a Heidelberg or a lot of these other scanning systems are going to just output a TIFF. Mm -hmm. They're going to give you a set format which means it's already been put within block ends. The beauty of a raw file, and that's one of the reasons we love the Hasselblad scanners is because of that raw file and it gave us that flexibility. Well, now with the phase one digital back and you know we have 16 stops, 15.5 stops of dynamic range. It's got an amazing DMAX. And we have this raw file that just gives us so much latitude. So even if I'm a little over or a little under in my capture, I have the power in the software to put that file exactly where I want it. Um, it's the same as if I'm shooting versus um, if I'm scanning, which is really the beauty of this system. So I just wanted to highlight, you know, kind of the differences there. And of course we can do, this is from a 35 millimeter Chrome, 
just straight out of the gates, like no white balance made, no anything. Uh, the Imicon versus the, the phase, the Hasselblad X5 versus the phase, so 35 Chrome. And again, those files could be adjusted because they are proprietary raw files, but I wanted to show you just what the root raw looks like. What does it come out of the system looking like? Um, and the beauty is, is on the phase, we can see a lot more detail in our shadows. We can see a lot more detail and information kind of there in the trees on the backside of that lake. Uh, and that's data that can be pulled out in post in Photoshop. Um, so that's the real advantage of this. Now I did do, we did have a couple of drum scans made and this is a six by seven negative that was um, shot by Eric, um, by Eric Luden. And we had a drum scan made from a couple of different um, houses. And then we did a scan on our instant image capture with the phase one digital back. Um, and if you look at them, the, the drum scan is a little bit flatter. It's a little bit more washed. The, the phase has a little more depth to it. Uh, ultimately, when we deliver files, we try to deliver a very flat file as well, because it's not for us to determine what your vision is. It's for you to take that into post-processing and, and take the image and make it look like what you saw in your head, like what your thoughts were. But the big thing that I want to highlight is when we zoom to 100%, and if you really look at this, if we really pixel peep, yeah, okay, there's some differences, but are they gigantic? And for the majority of people, like a drum scan and our system are going to, for a good drum scan, I have to highlight that because I've seen some drum scans that are just actually awful, you know, just some, you know, technician that's making 15 bucks an hour and doesn't really clear, you know, they, they, they slap the film on the tube, they ramp it up, they get a file, they send it, you know, they're not putting the time into it. Um, so for a good drum scan, for somebody who, you know, you trust and you value, you know, they handle your film well, if you get a good drum scan in comparison to the phase um, scan, they're very similar. I mean, the tolerances are very, very close. Uh, you know, so people are like, well, my drum scan is good enough. I can go with that. But I have to highlight all of the other reasons that we've talked about. Time, potential damage to the film, cost, right? If I have 100 images that I want to put in a book, and it's gonna cost me $150 per image for a high-res drum scan from a tech that I really like and I trust. And it's gonna take three to five weeks to get the work done because they're busy, right? So now I'm thousands of dollars to wait for these images to come back to me to hope that everything's right and I don't have to have any rescans made versus an instant capture system where we have it done in a couple of days um, and you know it's 50 bucks a scan. 30 bucks a scan, you know, depending on the size of the job. If you go in and look at our website, as we increase volume, we decrease price. Uh, so not only is it going to have significant cost savings, but if there's ever anything that like, oh, I didn't mean to do that one. I meant to do this one. It's, it's not going to be this like, well, crap, that's another $150 I got to spend. No, it's an additional 30 bucks. No problem. Right. Send it in. We'll take care of it. Right. And for large archives, we can go below the $20 per capture mark. So I think that that's, you know, really reasonable. Yeah. For those of you out there who have a thousand plus pieces, Call me and I'll come to you. I'm coming to that. One of the things that I wanted to highlight is this is a piece of film that I scanned, um, I digitized recently, and you see kind of the, the sprinklies going on on it and those little dots. And some people are like, well, maybe it's mold, maybe it's dust. It's not. What it is, is it's the silver halides separating from the gelatin layer in the film. And I just wanted to point that out, um, you know, this little grab of that. Uh, because if film isn't stored correctly, if it wasn't fixed correctly, if it's not maintained in the right environment, it has the potential to break down. And people think, what do you mean? Film is supposed to be archival and da da da. Yeah, if it was done right, if your chemistry was mixed right, if your chemistry was mixed at the right temperature. How many of you guys, you know, back in college or the early days of your careers were being incredibly exacting and, and taking notes on everything? Um, some of you, okay. For the rest of us, yeah, we did kind of the good enough. It's like cooking and you do it by taste, right? And a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah, I'm getting pretty good results. Let's roll with that. Um, but what that means is in the long term, your film is not going to be as archival as you think. And that's something you really want to pay attention to. Now, going back to the reasons to, to digitize your archive, film breaks down. And once it's gone, it's gone. And it can't be printed again. If we get it digitized, and it, if it starts to break down, if you start to see some degradation in your film and you get it digitized right away, that can be fixed in Photoshop. There's a lot of whole things. There's a whole lot of things. There's a lot of whole things. That's my that's Southern coming out right here. There's a whole lot of things that can be fixed in Photoshop. Uh, and so I just wanted to highlight that. That's one of the reasons that, you know, like, hey, take a look at your film. If it hasn't been stored correctly and started to break down, get it to a point where you can fix it. You can always send it to us. We have a customized vault case. It's a Pelican vault case. You can buy these anywhere. Ours is custom built with a three ring binder on the inside so that you can load your film, UPS it to us. If it's more than 50 scans, so if you have more than 50 pieces 
um, images to, you know, slides, chromes, four by fives, whatever, eight by tens. If you have more than 50, we'll pay shipping both ways. We'll pay for the thing to go to you. You load it up, send it back to us, and then we'll pay to send it back to you. We'll pay for shipping both ways. Uh, oh, if it's Scott, less that is that, a terrific deal. That's a great deal. How many people pay shipping? Most people are like, yeah, send it to us. We'll take care of it. You know, and the next thing you know, you're, you know, I, I just shipped some, some stuff to a friend in Canada and it ended up costing me $270 by the time I paid for insurance and the, the checks and the, da, 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 da. I mean, that was incredibly expensive, you know, um, the, the cost of that shipping so that, you know, we'll absorb that cost because, you know, we believe in what we're doing. We believe in passing those savings along to the customer because of the advantages to our system. Now, for those of us that, uh, for those of you out there that have larger collections, um, you know, I, uh, we are in the process of just wrapping up our van. This is our Dodge ProMaster customized digital mobilization station. Uh, Say that can, three times fast. <laughs> so what we've done is we, we purchased a Dodge, uh, purchased a Dodge Sprinter van. It's a ProMaster and uh, had a really talented uh, ship's carpenter build out the inside for a portable lab. So we're gonna have the archive system on the inside. Uh, that's the, you know, the Atom phase one instant capture system. We'll have a printer in there, uh, Canon Pro 1000 to be able to crank out some prints. People wanna see proofs right away or 100% zooms. Um, and everything's built uh, with uh, quality control, air control, heat, air conditioning, ionizer on the inside, anti-static mats, because dust is my enemy. And I'll be able to take this to wherever. If somebody has a large collection that's Im important and they don't wanna package it up and send it to our Belmont lab, let me know. We work it out. I hop in the van. I drive to you. You can walk the film right out to the van and I do it right then and there. If you prefer to keep the material inside, so in the studio or, or you know, the, uh, the gallery, uh, we have it set up to where I can pull the hardware out of the van and bring it inside. And that's what we call our white glove service. So, if, you know, if somebody has bigger collections out there, we can definitely do this for you. I'm going to be taking this thing on tour. So Chicago, St. Louis, Denver, LA, come on guys. Get me some film to scan. I'd love to do it for you. Reach out to me. Some things to consider once you have your film archived, and I'm trying to move us forward, um, move us forward here because I can talk about the van all day. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be cool. Um, is what do you it's been do with fun your film? building the van out too? Oh, it's it's uh, we've gotten we've gotten creative. You know, we all we have all our meetings on. You know, what should go where and how's it going to look? And you know, it's uh, it's. It's not a camper van. It is a work van. We just have to keep that in mind. I'm not going to be able to live in the thing, but you know, I can drive around and digitize your film. It's going to be awesome. So now that you have your film digitized, you send us, you know, you get the Volk, you know, you, the, the Pelican vault case and you send us your film, we digitize it for you. Some considerations that I want you guys to think about is how you're storing that film. Now there is the traditional, I just have a hard drive. I've got dozens of these things laying around. You know, my, my Lacy hard drives, uh, the, the new kind of go-tos for Digitex are these Samsung T5s and T7s, SSDs. Um, you know, I have a 160 hard drives on the shelf behind me, I think, of my archive that I, uh, you know, as a commercial photographer, stuff that I've shot over the years. Everything went on to a RAID and the second set of hard drives, um, RAID zeroed, went to a friend's house. So I, you know, Lots of expense in hard drives and storage and, you know, worrying about when those hard drives are going to fail. If you just got a couple of things, have a couple of hard drives, you know, two locations, three locations is good. If you've got a larger collection and you're really starting to digitize all of that material, you might want to consider a RAID. And there are several RAIDs out there. A little research, a little Googling can help answer a lot of those questions. The two that I highlighted here were RAID 0 and RAID 5, which tend to be the most common. And a RAID 0 is just mirrored. Right? It's a hard drive and a hard drive. I write it to this hard drive, it writes to this hard drive. If I erase it over here, it erases it over here. Everything is mirrored. Now, not the most secure. If I lose a hard drive, right? If I lose a hard drive and I put a new hard drive in, hopefully I can copy the data from one hard drive to the other and then I still have my, my material maintained. RAID 5 tends to be safer and that it's multiple hard drives. So four hard drives with striping. And what that means is it writes data across all four hard drives, data, 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 data. So if you lose a hard drive, you throw a blank drive in, the other three drives go, oh wait, these are the blocks that need to be there because it's just technology, it's ones and zeros, right? Um, so it's gonna be more secure. So if you're, you're working on your home system, you've got a big gigantic collection of grandma's photos that you're archiving, uh, you know, like my mom is doing, um, a RAID, you know, is a very good solution. For but everything else- It's always else, in one location though, right? 
it's still always in one location and that's the problem. Uh, there are cloud services and I've used cloud services for a couple of years now. I've, I've, used, um, I've used a couple of different ones that I've tried. Uh, some of them are great and some of them are less great. There's loads of choices out there. Uh, we are friends with the guys at Drawbridge Digital. Um, so check them out, drawbridgedigital.com. And what they do is they offer um, both a hardware and a cloud service option, meaning they'll build out a RAID, put it into your studio, and then link it up to an offshore site. And it's um, the speed of it is incredible. It's almost real time. It's, you know, it's not as slow as when you click upload and then you come back a day later and it's still sitting there like dropping files. You know, we're not the old dial-ups. Technology is there to be very, very fast. And the importance about having an offsite um, location or storage of your files, is if you lose that hard drive, if some disaster happens, uh, if a flood happens or a tornado or the world goes into pandemic meltdown and all your hard drives decide to die, at least you have that data stored elsewhere. And that's the important thing is with digital, it's incredibly scary because it's just ones and zeros, right? It's just data. We're taking this, this analog physical thing and we're turning it to ones and zeros. Uh, ones and zeros has a lot of utility, right? Going back to that utility slide, we can do a lot with it, but you do need to be diligent about your backup and have a strategy or have a solution in place. And again, any questions that you guys have for those of my people that are out there watching this, like call me, email me, reach out to me. I'm happy to, I, I'm, I'm really happy to help you answer those questions and come up with a plan for not only digitizing your film, but also creating an archive or a storage solution. Some best practices, some things that I want you to keep in mind, know the native resolution of your scanner. If you know, you're like, you know what, my Epson is good enough. My, my Canon is good enough. Like this is what I want. Uh, cause I'm only archiving my family, you know, history, um, totally cool. I, you know, I don't need to use digital silver imaging service. Uh, that's totally cool. Um, I get that. I understand, um, know the native resolution of your scanner. And I just, I just want to emphasize this because if you try to up res or pixelate it, you're, you're actually like adding information to the file. That's not really there. It's, it's the software guessing at the information that needs to be there. And that's no good. You want to go with whatever the native resolution is. That's going to be the best possible scan out of that individual system. So right. whatever one you're using, like, look at those details. I know on the Epson, it says that it has a maximum resolution of 12,800 that's interpolated, right? Their, their, their max res is 600 um, PPI. Um, on that V850 and it's 12,800 with interpolation. So you don't wanna do the interpolation, you wanna do whatever the native of that system is. Scan it full res downsize later. Don't go in and, and make the mistake of scanning it 200 by 300 because it's fast and you've got a lot of work to do. If you're gonna take the time to do it, do it at full res and downsize later. That's why with our system, with our instant image capture, we do everything at full res, we hand you a full res file. If you need to downsize it for web or Instagram or social media or something like that, you have the option to do that. But once you, you know, if you if you have a file that's low res and then all of a sudden you go, oh my God, this is getting, this is, this is an amazing image of Bruce Springsteen, you know, like our friends. And I now want to make a print of it, but I only scanned it at 200 by 300. Now all of a sudden you have to go through the process of finding the film and rescanning it, which is time and expense. Yep. Do it once, do it right. You know, just do full res at the very beginning. Wear lint-free gloves. Come on, you guys, don't manhandle your film. The oil on your hands is something that can cause long-term and damage to film. And, you know, people are like, oh, I'm responsible. I only hold the edges. But, you know, if you, you know, if you've been sweating a little bit or you got a little extra grease on your hands, you get that on the edge and then you stick it back into your, your print file and stick it on the shelf, you come back a year or two later and look at that film again and you're going to start to see breakdown. So put gloves on. It's not that hard. Gloves are cheap. If anybody needs gloves, email me. I'll send you some. Gift from me. I'll send you lint-free gloves. Send me your film. I'll send you gloves. How does that sound? I like that better. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> uh, use a bubble duster. And at the bottom, I say, don't use canned air on your film. Use a bubble duster. I kind of have those in two separate places. Uh, canned air is a chemical-based thing. And if you've ever taken a canned air and turned it upside down and psh, frozen somebody's leg as they walked past you, it's one of my... It's one of my things I like to do to my kids, in the, you know, when I'm in the dark room and ah, wake up, you know, um, canned air is a chemical based thing. And if you're not careful and you get that chem chemical on your film, all of a sudden you have to go through and it's a cleaning process and it's not good for it. It's also not good for you to inhale. So avoid canned air as much as possible. Bubble dusters. You want to be gentle with your film. That film has value. Be gentle with it. Uh, if you are using a legacy system, so a Nikon cool scan or an older flatbed scanner or an Imicon slash Hasselblad scanner, let the system warm up. You know, if you power it on and make a scan right away, 
throw the scan away and do another one because those bulbs and those internal parts need to be warmed up in order to give you the best possible results. Uh, you know, the advantage to an SLR system or like our instant image capture, there's no warm up needed. You know, you throw it in, you take a picture, you're moving on. Uh, but for any of the legacy scanners, flatbed scanners, you need to let those warm up. Um, capture with maximum data in mind, that goes back to capture at full resolution, scan at full resolution, get as much information as possible out of it, and then down res later. Uh, adjust for post, um, adjust in post for prints. An image is not done, an image is not completed until it's printed. And yes, we work for digital silver imaging. Our, you know, our ultimate goal and pleasure in life is to make prints of your work. Please check out our website. Uh, please look at what we do with our unique digital silver imaging process, but I am a therm believer. Um, I'm an educator. I've taught at Parsons School of Design. I'm now teaching College of the Nevada. An image isn't done until it's printed. I tell my students this. I tell my children this. I teach at a summer camp in Connecticut. It doesn't matter how many pictures you take until you make a print and you live with it. It's something that you're proud of. This is my daughter, by the way. Um, it's something that you're proud of and you want to hang on the wall and share with the world that, you know, that's a completed image. Then that's become something. That's something that has value and is important. So, you know, make prints, you know, make adjustments for prints and posts. Don't try and do it in the scanner. Get a maximum res scan, get it into post-processing, Lightroom, Capture One, Photoshop, and make your adjustments and then make a print. If you make it on your own home printer or you send it to us, um, we, we have the pleasure of doing your prints for you. Right. Also, Calibrate you, your I want to make a point that if you don't scan flat, and if you're trying to scan for uh, an output or to show on screen, then you're probably uh, leaving some, clipping some data uh, out of that image one way or the other. Absolutely. Get as much as you can in there. Mm -hmm. And, and if, it's, if it's more than we need when we go to print, uh, don't worry. Uh, our man, Christopher, will take a very good job of it. You know, he takes very good care of it, a master printer, and really, really does wonderful work. Guaranteed to be the best. Calibrate your monitor. This is really important. If you're working on any kind of monitor, whether it's your laptop or uh, an external monitor, calibration is necessary because if it looks awful on your monitor and you're making adjustments in post, and then you send the file to your printer or you send it to us to be printed and you get a print back that looks awful, you know, I mean, that's, that's something that is a real challenge. You need to have a calibrated monitor. If you don't know how to calibrate your monitor, a little Google on that. There are calibrators. Uh, I personally use the i1 Pro from x -Rite. Yeah. Um, the spider, you know, the spider is also very good. There are a few other ones out there that are less awesome. Those are kind of the two main ones on the market. I use the I1 just because they've given me the most consistent results over the longest period of time. Like I've been using it for a very, very long time. I calibrate all my monitors. I even, I even calibrate my iPhone, by the way, because um, when I'm looking at things, I want to know what I'm looking at. Uh, and you can do that. So make sure your monitor is calibrated. Don't upres your files. That goes to scanning at your maximum. Uh, you don't want to, you don't want to up res, you know, via your scanner. You don't want to up res after the fact, uh, get as much information as you can from the scan. And, you know, that should be good enough for making prints. And of course, don't use canned air. Don't use canned air. Some frequently asked questions. And these are questions that are directed to us at the, you know, at the lab and with our scanning service. So these questions are really based on questions that we've gotten from customers in the past. Uh, should I cut my nags and unmount my slides? Uh, well, that depends. Um, if your nags are in full strips still, if they're in the full 36 or 12 or 24 frames, uh, you know, if you put them in a print file, which is five to seven frames, depending on the print file, print file that you're using, uh, that's fine. Leave it like that. If your slides are mounted, we don't need you to unmount your slides unless you want to see the film cogs. A lot of times the slide, uh, you shoot a 35 millimeter uh, chrome, and then when it gets mounted into the into the carrier, the, either the cardboard or the plastic, you're actually, you know, it's cropping the image just a little bit. If you want the full image, you want to see those those cogs on either side of the film, then yes, it's going to need to be unmounted. We can do that, you know, it, when you, you send it to us and say, oh, I want to see the full film, there the, there will be a handling cost for us to do it, um, to pull each one out of this out of the slide carrier and then put it in another slide carrier um, or back in, depending on the slide. So really, that's just a that's a question up front. No, you don't need to unmount your slides if you if you're just looking to get what's exactly what you're seeing in the slide. It our carrier is specially designed. It goes right in and it slides back and forth. You've seen that on some of our other videos, and we just you know we take a capture of it. Uh, if the nags, the only reason you need to cut them is if they're in the full um, full rolls, and we need them down to like uh, between five and seven images on a strip. Can I wet mount on my flatbed scanner? Yes, you can. The Epson V850, you can wet mount either with oil or with this um, cami fluid. Uh, the disadvantages are is it's messy. 
And if you're not a very careful slash diligent person, um, what's going to end up happening is you're going to put too much oil or too much fluid on, and then you put the film down. And when you close the lid, it squishes everything and it comes up, it gets all over your glass and it makes a huge mess. You got to stop what you're doing, pull everything apart, clean everything, let it all dry, and then try again. It's a very uh, labor intensive process. Yes, you Why can. Why would you ever want to do that, Scott? Why would you ever the want to The advantages to wet mounting, either on a drum scan or on a flatbed, is the oil or the fluid material fills in the air gaps in the film. So if there's any scratch or little dings or any kind of imperfections in the film, or if the film's not sitting perfectly flat, um, the, the oil or liquid material fills in that gap. It, it fills in that air gap. It doesn't give you a higher resolution scan. It doesn't up your scan at all. All it does is fill in that material so you get a cleaner scan. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, so there are advantages to wet mounting um, for systems that can utilize it because it does fill in those gaps. Uh, with ours, because it meets those FADGI standards, you can't have any external material touching your film because the film, uh, the film as a historical item has value, which is where these standards come from and live oh. from. So, um, so uh, drum scans don't meet FADGI standards. No, no, you can't. You can't take. No. You can't take a drum scan, and and because of its uh, part of the FADGI standards is not just the quality of the file that's output, but the process in getting the in getting the file. Um, and that's the whole thing with our system is that it meets that that QC that quality control of not only giving you the maximum resolution file and the best scan possible, but also um, the least potential for damage. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you're not wet mounting, you're not risking, because if you wet mount, then you got to clean it. So, you know, now you're all of a sudden you're taking your film and you're cleaning it and you run the risk of scratching it or something else. Yeah. So that's to keep in mind. Uh, what monitor should I use? Now, this is, a, this is a good question. And I get asked this often, and I've been asked this question for years and years and years. Something to keep in mind, if you're working on a laptop, it's a backlit screen. It's gonna be really bright and sexy and look good. It's designed to, you know, watch movies or see images or, you know, look at your Facebook or your MySpace profile. Yes, MySpace. I know MySpace doesn't exist anymore. I was just throwing <laughs> that in there. It's just Scott's sense of humor. My MySpace problem is getting a lot of attention. <laughs> 20 years ago um no but that's the whole thing with a laptop now you can calibrate uh your laptop monitor but it's calibrated via the video card if you're going to an external monitor you're working on a desktop with an external monitor um here i have an external monitor um the thing to look at is it hardware profiled versus video card profiled uh you know your cheap walmart for <clears throat> excuse me a little cup of coffee the cheap you know cheap monitor that you can get for you know 80 or 100 dollars, 100 and quarter dollars uh, that's going to be a monitor that's still profiled via your video card. It's still going to be important to profile that monitor, but it's not going to give you the most accurate color reading. Uh, that's one of the things, if you look at an image file on different monitors, you know, you, you put it on yours, you put it on a friend's, you, you, you send it to a lab, and then you go look at it there. Um, everyone is going to look slightly different. Now, when you get to the top of the food chain of monitors, a hardware profiled monitor is going to give you the most accurate results. And the hardware profiled monitors are going to be the NEC, uh, NEC uh, BenQ or ISO. And I think Dell might make one as well. Um, for all the other monitors, they, they don't have internal hardware to profile them. They get profiled via your video card. So what monitor should I use? What monitor can you afford? Like what's your budget? What are you doing uh, as far as your career and your images? Is it worth the expense? Is it worth spending a thousand or $2,000 on a hardware profiled monitor? Um, or, you know, am I just doing this as a hobby on the side? I just need it pretty close. I'll buy a calibrator and that's good enough. So that's really an internal question for you guys on what yeah. to use. As a printer, uh, it, as a printer, Scott, I got I have to say too that um, we we deal with clients, you know, large and small that are using all different kinds of monitors. But the big difference is who calibrates. Even people, it makes a world of difference, even on your laptop. If you're preparing a file on your laptop and you're calibrating your laptop. And I know a lot of people are using Apple monitors. It makes a huge difference there too if you're using a, a calibration device like X Rite, Psi One. Um, it, it just it's just a world of difference. Absolutely, it's totally you know that's that's a minimum investment. Whatever monitor you're using, yeah. that's a minimum investment. Ensuring that you have proper colors and 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 you know you're looking at everything correctly with the right color temperature, the brightness, and then the color rendering of that monitor. It's two hundred dollars. You know, it's like come on, totally worth it. It's completely, and it's not complicated to use. They, I mean, they, they walk you through everything. The steps are right there. Um, so anybody who's dealing with images at all, 
buy a profiler, you know, no matter what monitor, even if you're using a cheap monitor, um, it'll, it'll make a difference in your life. And you'll, you'll, you'll thank me. You'll thank us later. You'll be like, oh man, why didn't I do this sooner? Uh, is a properly calibrated monitor necessary? Next and frequently asked questions. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so much when you're, when you're looking at files, when you're doing video, when you're working in retouching in Photoshop, when I'm working in Capture One, or if I'm going to print, like if your monitor is not properly calibrated, it's disaster. And, I, and I've had that before where I've worked with art directors. Um, you know, I was working as a commercial shooter and as a Digitech, and I've worked with art directors where I would send them files from a shoot and they would email me back about just how horrible these files look and they couldn't believe that I would deliver files these ways. And it, I mean, it got so bad with one art director that I made it a point to go to their office and calibrate their computer for them. I calibrated, I brought my calibrator and said, I'm gonna help you just give me a shot, you know? Let me have an argument in this conversation. And they were like, yeah, okay, fine, go ahead. I calibrated their monitor for them and they were like, oh my God, everything I've been looking at has been wrong. I've been making all these judgments that are wrong. And I was just like, you're welcome. I'll take a bonus, <laughs> you know, like, it's so incredibly important. Yeah, you're just guessing if your monitor is not calibrated. You're yeah. just guessing. Take the time, buy a calibrator, it's totally worth it. If you don't have one and, and you're afraid of doing it, find somebody. We all have relationships out there. Somebody knows a nerd that probably has one. If anybody's, if anybody's in Texas, call me, I'll come visit you, I'll bring mine. Uh, how long is this going to take? Uh, that's a question that gets asked often, and that really depends on what you're having done. So in reference to scanning, and this is specifically directed towards our instant image capture, um, our phase one system, how long is this going to take? It depends on the size of the job. If it's just one image, we can have it done in a day, right? We just put it into the queue and we crank it out right in there. If it's a body of work, we work with you, but on how long that's going to take. Uh, the Elliot Irwin archive that I worked on in, in New York City at Elliot Studio with our white glove service, we, we did approximately 3,500 images. Um, there was a lot of metadata involved. Everything had to match. File naming had to match. Images had to match thumbnails. It had to live in specific folders. So there was a lot of backend work, which was a bit more labor intensive. That took me 15 days for 3,500 images with all of the organization, with doing QC um, by both Mio and myself to ensure that we, that we capture the right images, that the exposures were correct, that everything looked good. Um, it, was, it was 15 days. And that's, I mean, that's incredible. I mean, when you really get going, we can crank out a lot of work within a reasonable amount of time. So if you have a project of 100, 200, 500 images, um, you know, we're done inside of a week. That same work, done via a drum scanner is going to take significantly longer because if it's an hour to two hours per scan times 100 scans versus um, our system, which is a 60th of a second times 100 scans, I'm done in four or five hours. I just did the math and that's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. <laughs> so it's worth considering uh, with your project. Time, time has value. How long is this going to take? Give us a call. We'll let you know. If it's a couple, you know, sub 100, 200 images, we'll have it done in a day. You know, um, depending on how busy we are, but for the most part, like that can just be cranked out right away. How do you deliver files and in what format? And this is always a conversation with customers up front as they're bringing us our film. Like, well, what are you going to deliver? Are you going to give me JPEGs? No, I'm not going to give you JPEGs. If you ask for JPEGs, I'll give you JPEGs. Uh, because this is a phase one digital back and it's a phase one capture, everything gets processed through Capture One Pro. Uh, I am a Capture One Pro expert. Uh, it's the software that I use on a daily basis. Uh, and I can process high res tips, PSDs, JPEG, JPEG quick proofs. I mean, you tell me what you want and that's the file that I deliver. If nothing is spoken about, we deliver full 16 res tips. We give you the, the, the gigantic 16 bit file out of a phase one 151.3 megapixel digital back into a 16 bit tip. So it's gonna be an eight to 900 meg file that you can do whatever you want with. You have incredible amounts of potential and latitude. What if, if I want, Scott, what if I want that TIFF and I also want a smaller JPEG that I can use for, you know. You like bet, we can do that. It can be done. I mean, the beauty of the beauty of Capture One is we can create multiple process recipes. So if you if you have a project that you're working on and you need small JPEGs to go straight into a layout right away, but your high res tips um, are going to be held on held on hand so that we can make big, beautiful digital silver imaging prints out of them, um, you know, or you know, materials for your gallery show. Uh, we can do that. It's a matter of just building out those recipes according to the the specifications that you desire, and 
we hit process and then deliver that to you. So it's, it's incredibly flexible. There are photographers and people that I've worked out, um, worked with out there that are familiar with Capture One Pro, that are familiar with the IIQ format. Uh, they've requested RAWs. I'm happy to hand over RAWs because ultimately this is your work. All I'm doing is I'm being the medium in order to take that material and get it captured into a digital format. So if you're somebody who's familiar with Capture One, you work with the software, you're good at processing and you want that latitude, you just have that conversation with us and we can make that happen. Great. Uh, and of course, any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out. And for our last slide here, I just wanted to throw this up. This is a really wonderful chart that Andrea put together, because as we were having this conversation about our service versus other people's services, there are other labs that are scanning. You guys all have relationships with people out there, no matter where you are coast to coast or where you are in the world, your local lab, your local person that you've had a relationship with, and, that, and that's really amazing, and that's good, and I believe in those relationships, you know, definitely. Uh, we wanted to just like have a, a sheet of comparisons, like what are the difference? What are the difference in formats? What are the difference in costs? And so, you know, take a screen grab of this. If anybody wants, I'll email this to you, email me and I'll send it off to you so that you can see it. And it just talks about the file size, quality, speed of capture, negative, you know, and transparencies, what the system is capable of capturing. I mean, if you look at a flatbed scanner, the maximum you can do is 12 by 18. That's as big as you can go. If you have a 16 by 20 piece of art you want captured, your options all of a sudden change, um, you know, in, in how you're handling that. So that's something to take into consideration. With the Hasselblad scanner, the max size we could do was was a four was a four by five. Yeah, yeah, up to a four by five. You know, it, it was only capable of doing so much. With our system, we can do up to twenty by twenty four. So if you have a big twenty by twenty four Polaroid that you did um, from the Penumbra Foundation in New York City, uh, we can digitize it for you. You know, um, you, you have 20 by 24 flat art or you have a master print. I'm going to be headed back to New York um, in a couple of weeks to digitize a bunch of master prints for for Elliot, which is going to be amazing. And that's because, you know, the master print is something that's done in the dark room has already have the, the love given to it. It's taken that negative and turned it into something. And, you know, uh, the, the team at Elliot Studio and Mio and, and Rick really loved what we did and what we delivered. And they said, hey, would you do master prints? Could we take and digitize? some of these master prints to streamline that um, archivization workflow. And that's the beauty of it is that we can do up to 20 by 24. So take a look at this uh, as far as cost resolution, it's a breakdown. Uh, it's broken down over information that we found online on the internet and from varying labs across the country. And, and the labs, we're not gonna name them, but we looked at three trustworthy, well-known labs and what they were offering and tried to just give an average of costs and comparisons based on the material that we could find. So right. definitely take a look at that. Any questions, if anybody wants, I'll email it to you. Just reach out to me. Um, thank you. Reach out to us with questions, image capture or print services. We are here to scan your film. We're here to digitize. Like, you know, there's no shortage of that. This is all about me telling you, hey, we offer an amazing service. I'd love the opportunity to do it for you. And of course, print with us. Um, if you've never printed with digital silver imaging, give us a try. Uh, you know, our, our technicians, our print technicians are, are some of the best in the business and our unique digital silver imaging process, giving you a true silver halide print from a digital file uh, is unsurpassed in the whole of the United States. So take a look at it. Give us a try. My contact information is there on the bottom of the screen. That's my email. And that is my cell phone number. You call that 917 number. That's going right here to me. Um, I will answer. I'll answer your questions. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you about our service or about helping you take your archive and, and make a plan, get it put in a direction that, that you want in order to, to have that legacy stored digitally. Right, so I just wanna add there that uh, if you're watching this and you happen to live in Melbourne, Australia or someplace like that, please take into consideration that Scott lives in Texas. So- uh, uh, I have friends in Melbourne and Sydney. <laughs> Peter Eastway, Christian Fletcher and Tony Hewitt. What's up boys? Yeah, there you go. Shout out, represent. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, this was great. And again, I don't think I can add anything else, Scott, but if you do want to contact us, we're on the, we're on the web, on the World Wide Webs as www.digitalsilverimaging.com. And you can reach us through our contact info there. We also have a page on our website. It's under scanning because unfortunately that is the term that everyone uses anymore, but we're really just doing digital capture anymore. And you yep. just heard why that is the way to go. So uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, all the best. Thanks for reaching out. Thanks for watching guys and uh, ping me with questions. I'm, I'm here for you. All and right. I, hope to be, I hope to be working on some of your work soon.
second that. Awesome.